Namaste, and welcome to episode two of The Inward Way. This is Jim Young, your host for The Inward Way podcast programs. A belated Happy New Year to you all. I hope 2022 is treating you well so far and that you are celebrating daily the uh, gift to the universe you are. Yes, you, each of you, is the gift to this universe. Own it. I've been asked to uh, tell uh, the audience what namaste means. Uh, it's a Hindu word, Sanskrit, uh, which uh, for many comes out as I bow to the divine in you. However, if we realize that life itself is divine, all of life, then when you say uh, I bow to the divine in you, you're missing part of the you that you're calling divine. Life is all there is. Life is all we are. Uh, therefore, when I say namaste, I mean uh, I, buy, I bow to you as fully divine. All we have to do then is remember. <laughs> remember what? Remember that you're divine. Well, what happens if you forget you're divine? You behave as though you're not. Just remember that. When we forget what we really are, we behave as though we are not that. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's a little bit messed up with a, the weather. Winter set in, and I caught a little something last week, so forgive me if I don't sound clear <clears throat> Pardon me, and strong, but I'm going to continue anyhow. I told you I would bring you a program a week, and this is the second episode. Besides, uh, I'm not terribly adept at reading out loud. At any length, um, the last time I read out loud was when my five sons and daughters were just tykes. Uh, and then I would do, try to do that every night when we tucked one or the other of them in the bed. Uh, and then only, of course, it was a short period of time. But I'm finding that uh, partially because of uh, not practicing and also because of COVID, where I'm distanced from talking to people much of the day, uh, so that my vocal cords are a bit uh, uh, tense, I would say, stressed. <clears throat> Anyhow, you know by now that if you're here with me for the second episode, that you have checked into Spreaker to download uh, the app just the one time it took to get you here. Uh, and to listen uh, at any time at your convenience to any of the 31 books that I will offer to you uh, free as we move through the weeks and months ahead. You'll also be able to download any or all of them for listening pleasure as you travel, jog, walk, or simply sip a cup of tea or have a glass of wine with a friend. Well, okay then, here is episode two. I do know that you know uh, that uh, the process at this point is to share with you a post that I have found, hither, thither, and yon, and then to share with you uh, what I got as I went inward uh, to ask my inner voice what it is this particular post means to me, the truth of it for me. This is not to say that this is true for you. Remember, this whole program of, of, of a podcast is to provide for you an opportunity to check and see if you have resonance with anything that you hear, or if you're reading the books along the way with anything you read. It's for you to practice listening inwardly so you can master that as your way of moving through life from the inside out. Okay, here's the next post. <clears throat> Excuse me again. You can literally feel your energy being drained when you're around people you shouldn't be around. Intuition is an amazing gift, as I'm sure you all know by now. Actually, it's the endless strains of wisdom that ring true to us. The more we focus on the voice of wisdom, of intuition, we, the more we tune in to energetic renderings of all kinds. 
And the more we find our energy, the more we commit to living spiritually from the inside out. We gain along with such facility the ability to discern the energy we find ourselves in along our daily adventures, all of them. Whenever you find yourself feeling drained of energy when in the midst of certain others, that is a sign of two very important factors. One, your own energy is quite refined. And two, any dissonance in it is a sure sign that a shift in location or a way of thinking about the relationship may well be warranted, maybe even required, lest you become fully drained in such a setting by that person or a group or by your own thoughts about it. I've had plenty of conversations with friends and family who from time to time sound very tired, low in energy, weak-voiced, halting in conversation. From time to time, it happens to me as well. Just by carefully listening, fully making myself available to them, they'll usually spill the beans, divulge a recent conversation or gathering that was unsettling to them. It can be useful to continue listening as they describe the circumstances, paying particular attention as to what, it, what is really bothering them about the situation. Often it happens that the person who is disturbed is not disturbed so much with the person or persons they're with, but unconsciously reacting to the hidden denial of those same characteristics in themselves as they deal with themselves. Listening for resonance inwardly, it becomes apparent that a question or two may help the other. If they're feeling personally offended, for example, asking if they, if they ever offended themselves can bring them to keen insight about their relationship with self. That's where it all begins. Or if they're feeling abused or abandoned, asking in what ways uh, are they making, may be abusing themselves or even abandoning themselves? That can be an eye opener, I will tell you. Lending them, leading them to ask such questions of themselves will enable them to find real solutions to actual issues rather than pointing fingers at others. I, I'm not comfortable with them. There's the victim thing going. We must be careful, however, to not use this means to excuse the behavior or energy level of another. After all, life serves us in at least two levels, the inward way, spiritually, and out of ego consciousness. People who have yet to define their energy by living on a more spiritual level can give off energy that is off-putting, in disarray, even offensive. But remember, that says everything about where they are, not about you. Surely, we don't need to cast aside such people or groups, at least until we have first discerned inwardly what's going on inside ourselves. Once we have owned our real feelings, really acknowledged them and owned them, then it serves as well to even pay more attention to the energy we feel within the company of others. Keeping it all simple is the way. Go inward. Listen intently. Discern, discern truth for yourself. Evaluate the energy given off by others without being judgmental. And discern if either you or they might be violating your boundaries. If, that energy, if their energy fits with yours, stay with it. If not, it's time to exit the relationship, or at least until you discern things that have shifted within yourself for the better. Don't worry. Be patient, open, discerning, and don't be fearful of walking your own talk your, and walk, being in the energy in which you flourish. Little else matters. When the need arises to part company, using the phrase, it, this isn't working for me, inwardly makes it simple to act. Then should you choose to actually move on, the same phrase is all you really need. Just like both yes and no, each is a complete sentence requiring no further explanation. Because it says that isn't working for you, it's not about them. The next post. 
99% of harm is caused by your head to you and your thoughts. 1% of the harm is caused by reality, which actually happens and the outcome. What actually happens and the outcome? Most of the time, the problem isn't the problem. The way you think about the problem is the problem. This is such an important post. How often do we get our underwear all tied up in knots over things we have no control over? How often do we worry ourselves to the point of maximum distress, nail-biting episodes, panic-stricken times, only to eventually learn that we've done so in vain? Only to learn that none of our protestations did one bit of good to solve or correct an issue or set of circumstances. As parents, I'm confident many, if not all of us, have had our children in some imaginary ditch, beaten, perhaps even raped, only to find out that they were at a friend's home under the loving supervision of a friend's parents. Rarely have our thoughts designed design such matters accurately. So why is it that we engage so much energy in manifesting such freakish thinking? It's all contained in a four-letter word. Yes, one of those. Fear. We face we haven't raised our children the best ways. We fear we haven't raised our children the best ways. We fear others can't be trusted. We fear we have missed some important lessons that could have prepared us better. Not to worry or fret. At the head of the line is a thought that we're really, we fear we're not really good enough. Not a good enough parent. Not a good enough friend. Not a good enough caregiver. Not a good enough student of life. When in a fear state, it's a sure thing that we will see what happens to be some testy situation is exactly that. Testy, worrisome, catastrophic. Not so. So how can we learn to deal with such matters in a way that's more spiritually oriented? Surely you know the response by now. But let's investigate it briefly just in case you may have forgotten. When in what appear to be stressful situations, what's the first things to do? Acknowledge your feelings, whatever they are. Simply acknowledge them. Don't let them take you over. You are not your feelings. Your feelings come from your thoughts. The thoughts are yours. Once you know what you're feeling, simply ask what it is you're feeling and what's the thought behind it. Now the most important part. Now is the time to develop the capacity to listen, really listen inwardly for the accurate response. Once you discern the response, You'll be affirmed in the declaration that what you've really been feeling is fear, lack of trust. Fear of what? Ask again. You'll have it clarified in no time at all. Lack of trust? In what? The loving way, the wisdom that informs us only of truth. Truth about all matters, all feelings, even a sense of security. Discern, discernment of truth found only inward rests in trusting this process of awareness, that soft and gentle acceptance of wisdom conveyed. The more this simple process is practiced, the more proper will be our discernment of inward reality, of our authentic identity. Once we've reached that point and practice it faithfully, we come to comprehend that what happens around us is largely inconsequential and surely not what we think it is. Thinking is 99% of the problem, and forgetting to go inward is 100% is of that 99%. Life is pretty simple when we practice being and staying aware of our inner voice, while not allowing our former use of outer impingements to be an option for us. So the problem isn't about how we think about something, it's that we think and emote about something instead of adhering to the truth of the matter, found only inward. Okay, now just play with around with this for a bit. Think back to times when you've, you've used intellect rather than inner discernment to resolve your feelings and what resulted from that choice. 
Then replay the incident in your mind and ask inwardly, what really happened? What was the real answer or response required? By all means, don't criticize the former way of treating the incident. Simply sit in non-judgment and be grateful you now have a much better means of living in this world of ours, and that is living spiritually. And just think what a wonderful gift you could be sharing with others along the way, so they too can eliminate the 99% out of non-essential debris in their lives. Next post. If it's out of your hands, it deserves freedom from your mind too. Very interesting. The, the import of this post follows closely on the heels of the last. So often we take all uh, we take all life serves us as though it's ours to handle, take responsibility for, and by all means fix. We largely are fixers, we human beings. And then, having yet again judged that to be true, we set about minding it, thinking endlessly about it, overthinking it, and then taking action on it when it's really none of our business at all. So why do we make it our business? Have we developed a habit of being a fixer of some kind? Just as a way of making our life meaningful, fulfilled, giving us life purpose? Does it not even appear to us, does it not even appear to us that setting out on such adventures can diminish the character of the other for whom we think we should take their life in our hands? Do we not, do we not have confidence in the other to make take matters in their own hands? Or especially if they want to be fixed, that inserting ourselves in their life would undoubtedly end up being a very unhealthy codependency. If you want to escalate taking your own hands the life of some take into your own hands the life of someone else, even more in your mind, try this one on for size. If you believe in God, then why are you taking on God's job? Said in a different way. Do you think you're God or one who is supposed to heal all, fix everything to the way you think it needs to be? In the first place, there is no such God as that. Such a configuration is, is a made-up concept and is highly erroneous and misleading. Going down this road would take many more pages than I'm willing to give it right now. Besides, you can find that elsewhere, particularly in my earlier writings, that deal with transla translating biblical verse as metaphor. But it shall suffice to propose that perhaps we feel the need to take things out of others' hands so we can elevate ourselves by playing God. In another sense, if we can let go of the necessity of taking matters into our own hands, we see ourselves of many confining elements of daily living. Most importantly, we free up our minds for becoming an abiding awareness of our inner voice, our real identity, and the spiritual map for living authentically. Eventually, we stop taking things out of others' hands. Instead, we simply be there when others seek guidance, but always, and I do mean always, lead them across the threshold of their own innate wisdom instead of minding it for them. This is the ultimate win-win scenario. Everyone involved is thus free to find and then be true only to themselves, expressive but authentic spiritual beings, and expressing their true nature their true identity through all they are and do. What a difference this would be should that come to pass. The next post. Make yourself, hear that, make yourself a priority once in a while. It's not selfish, it is necessary. So many of us seem to confuse making ourselves a priority with being selfish. It's as though we are duty-bound to make all others a priority before or instead of honoring our own needs and callings. In, con in ego consciousness terms, it would surely be either of two ways. We should always put others before ourselves or 
It's selfish to make ourselves a priority over others. Ever heard those before? Uh, you betcha, I have. How about from a spiritual perspective? In a strictest sense, there is no other to put ourselves before. There is nothing but another example of the essence of life manifesting itself. Thus in, tr thus, in this sense, we can truly say that I am another you. I am another life expressing itself. In some societies, the emphasis is put on service to others. This comes mostly from church dogma. Service to others is how we are supposed to earn a seat in some kind of heavenly realm. Let's take a little closer look at this one by going inward for direction. Should we put aside our largely unfounded means of thinking we're separate from God and thus one another, we'll reach the truth of being we each are. That is, the infinite, ineffable essence of being manifesting itself throughout all forms of life. The essence of being is life itself, and in a spiritual sense, at its deepest and simplest levels, it is undifferentiated. Thus, life simply is what it is. Nothing more, nothing is less, and all it is. When we can accept this definition of love, we come to see that when we make ourselves a priority, we are automatically making all else a priority. In this sense, we are providing a valuable service to ourselves. At the same time, we are providing a valuable service to others, all others, by lifting them as we lift ourselves. Just because others might not see it in the same way doesn't mean it's not so. It means only that we often see with what we call different eyes. Some see through eyes of ego consciousness, others through eyes of spiritual consciousness. Thus, the choice is now yours. Always has been, is, and always will be. Which lenses seem to be calling you to discern life with? Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Just ask. Listen. Discern and abide the authentic, the authentic answer. Then get about being exactly that and nothing else, what you are. All it will take over the long haul is remembering your calling and following only that calling. Very quickly, you'll be in a spiritual consciousness groove and loving every minute of it. Now that is making yourself priority and inspiring and lifting all those around you likewise. Okay, the next post. Until you change your thinking, you will always recycle your experiences. Whoa. Hmm. Let me read that again. Until you change your thinking, you will always recycle your experiences. Hmm. Experience is a funny word. Funny to the degree that we point to outer events and circumstances even relationships of all kinds, and we call them experiences. Not true. All those represent is life happening, no labels attached. It's we who give all meaning to life's renderings. And then we think it's true that we've labeled it correctly, batching them all into a basket we call experiences. I'm, a right, I'm a, about to show you a curveball, or perhaps a perhaps a knuckleball, a little different something to handle and to take inward to discern resonance. It is we who give all meaning to life's renderings. If it is we who give all meaning to life's renderings, then it is that very meaning and none other that provides that very experience to life. The meaning we give to any occurrence is how we are experiencing it. If we give the meaning of pain to growing through, exercise, growing through exercise, that's how we experience it, painfully, and not such a good thing. If, on the other hand, should we give the meaning of perpetual growth to physical exercise, that's precisely how we experience it, as perpetual growth, and as a good thing. Thank you. To me, however, this posit is not about changing our thinking to change our experience. Okay, go inward, go inward now, right now, 
and ask yourself what it's really about for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait patiently. So, what is this posit really about, if not about changing our thinking? By the way, it's perfectly okay to not agree with anything you see here or hear from me. The key is to go inward and listen for your authentic voice as you ask and adhere to only that voice. So what did you get when you asked? Knowing that you are perfectly tuned to your inner voice, I'm willing to bet that what you heard was something akin to that you listened inwardly instead of thinking any way at all. The truth of your being will come to light. And it's that bit of enlightenment, that intuitive strike or insight, that will change how you experience every element of life, each situation and circumstance. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's true, however, that if you continue to use thinking as your essential vehicle of transporting life into being, at best you'll only be recycling your thoughts as labels for your experiences. The pattern will indeed repeat itself endlessly, and you'll forever recycle your experiences as a result. When something apparently new shows up in your life, refrain from thinking about and labeling it. Simply sit with it and feel its presence in your life. Do not, under any circumstances, make any judgments about it. As simply as you can, take it only as somehow happening in that particular moment of now, as you ask inward for the deeper meaning for you of this very entry into your life. Stop, look, and listen. What your inner voice calls you to see spiritually is the meaning you give to the event or happening. And know that authentically. That is what you'll be experiencing. What a different world you'll see and be. Well, I think that's about enough for today. It's nearly 30 minutes together. Thoroughly enjoyable for me because I'm seeing you in my heart of hearts as, as a... I take you through these books now to become audio books for you to listen anytime you wish. So I look forward to seeing you uh, beginning next Wednesday. Of course, these are uh, categorized on speakers so you can listen to them at any time. You can download them and make your own series out of it. Uh, I look forward to having you in my company for me to be in your company again next week. I'll close with this. I like to close with a little something I've seen from time to time between our meetings. I'll close with this. If you don't want the truth, don't listen to me. If you want something sugar-coated, go eat a donut. Well, namaste, dear friends. I love you. Have a great week.